Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me OK in the back? I have kind of, OK, good. <laughs> it's kind of a soft voice. Um, so I'm Lydia Gu. I'm a software engineer at B12 and one of the organizers here. And today, I'm going to talk about a tutorial on Thompson sampling. Um, so why did I pick this paper? Um, there's actually a lot, there's been a lot of activity in the area of multi-arm bandits and Thompson sampling in the past few years. Um, but not any particular paper stand, stood out as like a paper I loved. So I went with the tutorial because it's a really great introduction to it and it has some good examples and it's like really easy to read. Um, so with that, let's jump into the motivation. So why are we talking about this at all? Well, you might have noticed that the world has become increasingly personalized and you're getting recommendations for everything in your daily life. Like if you go onto Netflix, you'll get 10 movies recommended for you that they think you'll like. Um, or if you listen to Spotify, it'll re recommend you music based on your past um, listening history. Uh, so how are these recommend recommender systems implemented? Um, well, you have um, collaborative filtering. It's kind of like the one that everyone thinks of. Oh, a little closer? OK, is this better? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Technical difference. Oh, there we go. I think it's good now. Yeah. How's that? This is good, right? Yep, OK, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so collaborative filtering is kind of like the basic um, system that everyone thinks about. And that was the one that was popularized by Netflix. Um, so the way it works is that you have this dense matrix of uh, users um, and movies that they like. And then you can use that to recommend movies to people. Oh, there we go. It's a little bit down, right? OK, I was hearing a big echo. OK. Um, yeah, so you have a dense matrix of uh, users and the movies they like, and you can use that to recommend movies to people who haven't watched them before. Um, but the downside of the system is that you have to build up this like really large database of combinations of users and uh, movies. And I would like to, say, have a recommendation system that I can get going pretty quickly with not a ton of data, and it can already start making recommendations for me. And that's where the multi-armed bandits framework comes in. Um, so the name comes from the idea that you're a gambler and you go to a casino and you sit down to uh, play slot machines, a one-armed bandit. And this might be some quirk of English that confused me, but it's multiple one-armed bandits and not one multi-armed bandit, which would be kind of weird. <laughs> um, so uh, back to the problem, you have multiple uh, slot machines. And the idea is that each slot machine will probabilistically return some reward. Um, so what that might look like is, for example, um, this is a really basic example where each sl slot machine either wins or loses, and it does that with some probability. So when you play it, it either it has a 60% chance of winning or losing, for example, for this first one. Um, and then the second one's 40%, the third one's 45%. Um, so you're the gambler. You want to uh, get the most reward. So if you knew the win percentages, you would obviously play the first one, right? Because you would win the most. Um, oh, and just to introduce some terminology here, um, I talked about percentages uh, previously, but we'll refer to them just as fractions. And this uh, fraction of the time that they win is referred to as the mean reward. So we'll use that term a bunch in the rest of the presentation. Um, so the issue, though, is that as the gambler, I don't actually know what the mean rewards of each of the machines are. So I need to figure out some algorithm for playing the machines um, one by one or whatsoever um, to figure out what the mean rewards of the machines are. Um, so the simplest algorithm you can maybe think of is the greedy algorithm. And the way this works is, um, in the first step, you look at your history of arm pulls. Um, so here I have an example where I pulled the first arm a thousand times, the second one a thousand times, and the third one five times, and I've observed these fractions of wins. So I would pick the one that has the highest, which would be arm one, and I would pull that arm. And then I would observe whether or not I win or lose, and then update these counts for the next iteration, and then keep going until I eventually reach some sort of uh, optimal value. Uh, so you might wonder, like, there's actually a bootstrapping problem here. It's like, how did I get these numbers on the right if I always just pick the, the best one, right? So, um, oh, sorry. That's a, you know, that slide. Um, so they, uh, 
the way people actually do it is they do an epsilon greedy algorithm where just um, uh, epsilon is just a really small value. Um, and the update is that in step two, uh, for um, epsilon percent of the time, you just randomly pick one of the arms. And this is exploring the other arms. Um, and then one minus ex epsilon percent of the time, you pick the one that has the highest expectation. So that's exploiting the arms that you already know perform really well. Um, and so if we look at the arm pull example here, you might notice that both arm one and two I've tested a thousand times each. So I have a pretty high certainty about how well, uh, how accurately I'm measuring the mean reward. But for the last one, I've only pulled it five times. So while I've seen two wins, that might not be a very accurate representation of its mean reward. And so this uncertainty can be captured by this graph. So this graph is actually graphing the probability that the mean reward is, um, is a certain value, uh, yeah, a prob like a probability density distribution of the mean reward. So you can see for arm one and two are represented by the green and the blue lines. And so those are really peaked because I'm really certain what the mean rewards of those values are, uh, of, the, of those arms. But the third arm, which I've only measured five times, the probability density distribution is pretty flat because I'm not super certain what the mean reward there is. Um, so you might notice then that there's kind of an issue with the greedy algorithm, which is that it spends equal amounts of time exploring arms that it knows are not uh, optimal. So that's kind of summarized this by the sentence from the paper, which is that it's wasting resources by failing to write off uh, actions regardless of how unlikely they are to be optimal. And this is where Thompson sampling improves on this. So. The key difference for Thompson sampling is that instead of just picking the arm that has the uh, highest expectation, you actually sample from that probability distribution in to generate that estimate of the mean reward and then use that uh, sample to determine which arm to pull. So here I've illustrated uh, the greedy algorithm just picks the, the uh, expected value. And then Thompson sampling will sample from the distribution. So for distributions that are pretty flat, where there's not a lot of certainty about what the mean reward is, it'll try a bunch of random ones. Um, and so you know some percentage of the time, it's going to be higher than the current uh, like optimal one with the one with the optimal mean. So it'll try that one. Um, so how do we compare the greedy algorithm with Thompson sampling? So a common metric that's used in online learning is the idea of regret. And this is defined that as um, per time period, it's the difference between the mean reward of the optimal action and the action that was selected by the algorithm. So in the paper, they showed this uh, graph for the example we just looked at, which plots the um, regret of the greedy algorithm versus Thompson sampling averaged over 10,000 simulations. So you can see on average, the greedy algorithm ends up in like a local optimum or a local minimum, whereas the Thompson sampling algorithm actually reaches the global minimum. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to look at a slightly more complicated example just to kind of understand how to apply this multi-arm bandit framework. Uh, so. Let's look at my daily commute on the MTA. So I travel to work every morning and I have a bunch of options for trains to take. Like, should I take the local B train or the express D train? Should I switch uh, at Times Square to the NQR? Or should I stay on the one all the way to work? So I actually spent like a month logging all my train times, thinking that I <laughs> build this like large data set and then I could find out what the optimal path is, but I guess I should have known that I could have used this online learning method instead. Um, so this graph represents uh, the commute and the various like paths I could take through it. And in this, um, uh, you, in this example, the arm um, would be a selected path through the graph. And so the number of paths through the graph is the number of arms in this multi-arm bandit problem. Um, but you, you might notice that uh, the issue is that with each edge, um, or as you increase the number of edges, the number of paths scale exponentially. So it's not very computationally efficient. Um, and there's actually like a slight tweak to the algorithm we can make uh, in applying it that will make it more computationally efficient. Um, and then I should have mentioned earlier, also each edge, for now we assume that the travel time is independent and like drawn from some distribution. 
And even though I know like MTA does not have uncorrelated <laughs> delays, but we can just ignore that for the sake of this example. Um, yeah. So the the different the modification that's made is that instead of um, tracking the distribution of the entire path, we do that for each edge. So uh, the first step of the algorithm is that we estimate the mean of each edge. So for the greedy algorithm, that would be just the expected value of the distribution. For Thompson sampling, that would be sampling from the distribution. Um, and then so with that value uh, for each edge, we now just have a deterministic shortest path uh, problem. So you could just use a, you know, your normal shortest path algorithm to figure out what the best path is. And then you apply that path, observe the outcome, and then update the edges for the um, update the distribution for the edges that were traversed in that path. Um, yeah, so that was an example. And so now to recap, um, the reason at a high level that Thompson sampling performs so well is because it's only sampling where there is uncertainty, and it discards choices that are very unlikely to be optimal. Um, and also a bunch of smart people proved theoretically that it has optimal bounds. Um, you can read those <laughs> papers as well. And so let's look at how it's been used in practice. Um, so here, uh, Netflix wrote a blog article about how they've applied the multi-arm bandit framework to selecting images to show with movies. So they have a bunch of options, so these are the arms, and they pick the image that they think is most likely to convert users into, into watching the movie. Um, and then similarly, at the startup that I'm at, uh, we're a web design startup, uh, similar to Squarespace or Wix, uh, but the idea is that we build your website for you and provide you things like personalized recommendations. So every month we send uh, an email with some recommendations for how our customers can improve their site and kind of keep it up to date. And so we pick these recommendations from a library of hundreds of recommendations, and so we've applied the multi-arm bandit um, framework to help us select these recommendations. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs> Thanks.